So uh, I'm Brett Weber, a public health policy and programs manager with the National Indian Health Board, and I'll be facilitating this webinar along with my uh, colleague, uh, Julie Seward. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Seward here. I'm the oral health programs manager at the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board. And next slide. So yeah, this webinar is being sponsored by the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board, Oklahoma Area Tribal Epidemiology Center through the Native Oral Health Network. The Native Oral Health Network is a community of practice that provides a platform for resources, peer support, and community engagement to improve oral health in Native communities. And Brett, I'll let you talk about um, NIHB's program. Sure, so uh, the National Indian Health Board is also very pleased to uh, be offering um, this webinar. The Tribal Oral Health Initiative was uh, created several years ago by our board of directors to examine solutions to uh, an oral health, uh, essentially an oral health crisis in Indian country where, uh, whereas we see in many other um, areas, uh, in many other health metrics, where tribes are at the um, bottom of health outcomes, that's very true in oral health as well. So the Oral Health Initiative was um, created to examine solutions and provide recommendations for, uh, for Indian country to confront, uh, confront those disparities. So I just wanna go through a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as I mentioned before, attendees are gonna be muted um, and this webinar will be recorded for, uh, for those of us who were not able to join at this time. Um, you can see the chat box, uh, and given the number of people we have, that's probably going to be the, the best way to facilitate questions. So uh, all of our presenters will, will speak, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. If you do have a question um, during a presentation, do feel free to send it through the chat box um, so you don't forget it, but we will, we will address questions uh, at the end of this webinar. And we are uh, very pleased to be able to offer 1.5 hours of continuing dental education credit for this webinar. And the information for that will be given out at the end of the webinar. Uh, and we will also be sending out a short evaluation to all attendees. Please do uh, uh, give us your feedback because that does help us provide um, future webinars and, and quality content that is helpful to you. Um, so, so please do uh, uh, complete that evaluation. It should only take a couple minutes. And I think over the past couple of months, all of us have gotten pretty good at using Zoom or, or web-based um, uh, programs like this. But if you do encounter any technical difficulties, we do have a few folks ready to help you out. Uh, please email either Sarah Zdunek at szdunek at nihb.org or Alex Holt at aholt at sphb.org if you have any of those technical difficulties. So our speakers today are going to be Dr. Paula Van Buskirk, who's the Chief of Dental Services at Chickasaw Nation Department of Health, who will be talking about some of the teledentistry services that her tribe has been able to offer patients. And we'll be, we'll be hearing from Dr. Latanya La Shelton Miller, at, who is the dental director at the Absentee Shawnee Tribe Little Axe Health Center. And she'll be talking about uh, how to safely reopen um, and, and what, a, what a safely reopened dental clinic looks like for tribes across the country. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Karen Luce, who's the dental director at the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. And she'll be talking about some reimbursement issues related to teledentistry that um, are specific to Oklahoma tribes, but there are also some generalities that will be relevant for tribes across the country. So with that, we will turn it over to Dr. Uh, Van Buskirk. Okay, great, there you go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as he said, I'm Paula Van Buskirk. I'm a pediatric dentist and chief of dental services with the Chickasaw Nation. And I do wanna clarify that I am not an expert in teledentistry. However, I would like to share my uh, experience with implementing teledentistry during the COVID-19 within our dental department. Um, if I could get a slide change. 
And this is, you know, just my disclaimer that I do not have any investment or anything to financial interest or relationship with any entity mentioned in the presentation. I thought this uh, quote was appropriate. I, um, considering the times and the changes that we are experiencing in dentistry, including with virtual visits. As we've all experienced our individual responses to the statement that was released um, from the AD recommending that the dentists dentists nationwide postpone elective procedures due to the spread of the coronavirus, which was released on 16 uh, March 16 2020 and that was spring break for Oklahoma. So several staff members had taken it off to be with family and it was like a light switch being turned on and then off. So we had to regroup once we came back and I think everybody felt that and that to me was the birth of virtual visits for uh, the Chickasaw Nation. Next slide. On March 17th, I think at that time, majority of clinics closed down and the, uh, the dental world was turned upside down. We were closed for business and we no picking up the drill. The ADA gave the dental profession a clear definition on what emergent or urgent dental needs were in a flow chart on how to maneuver through the process. This dramatic change, like many others, took staff took our staff of 90 and had them staring at the computer screen, completing some CE online, or checking the daily statistics of the effects of the coronavirus. We were fortunate though that the, den um, the dental department was repurposed into a labor pool, which mostly consisted of doing uh, patient and employee screenings as they come into the, the facilities. Um, we, were still be we were still seeing limited amount of emergencies as everyone else was. And it was, um, we, were, we started off with screening with, um, a seasoned dental assistant from the phone, you know, through the phone and with the guidance of the dentist in the room. Um, and um, that, that worked okay for a while, but that really wasn't um, where we wanted to be. And for the past year, we had uh, planned on implementing uh, teledentistry in the beginning of the fall of 2020. Um, uh, our medical colleagues in the Chickasaw Nation had started using it about a year before, and in the chief's meetings, they would talk about the pros and cons, the frustrations, um, and what was working well, and we had, uh, we knew that the dental insurances were not reimbursing for the services, but we had a plan to implement it because we knew it could be a tool to improve the provider-patient relationship. And we did have a dentist volunteer that she would contact new patients starting in the fall and introduce herself and discuss the appointment process with the patients and inquire about any concerns or questions that they may have. Um, so we ended up having to move that timeline up and um, had to start with teledentistry. Next slide, please. And of course, I know everybody's been keeping up to date with the ADA and the CDC guidelines, but the latest version um, is what we actually followed um, follow now is was released on May the 11th, 2020. And um, the organization developed a detailed guidance to aid uh, dentists on implementing the process. We feel like this was an opportunity for us to explore the virtual world without having to have a costly and structured process and not also having to go through as many hoops as we normally would have to go through in our organization. So we got the green, we got the approval to, to start off with it. And we start, as I mentioned earlier, we started off with the screening process with an assistant hanging out in the dentist office. Um, the, the call, direct the calls that were appropriate for screening. And then the dental assistant would screen the patient and report to the dentist her screening findings. And the dentist would inform the assistant of the steps needed to schedule the 
procedure or give advice, and then she would let, relay that on to the uh, patient. And um, that worked okay, but we really wanted to try to get the dentist more involved in it. Um, and they were a little unsure about that, which we'll just talk about later. But what would happen then is the dentist then would, uh, the assistant would give the information and to the patient, and she would scribe the note for the patient, the dentist to review, add, and sign, you know, as we normally do. And we weren't charging out for this as teledentistry at that time. This was just truly a screening process to determine, do we bring these patients in or do we treat them palliatively until we can, we felt like it was safe to bring them in or we get the go ahead to bring, bring them in. It was a long process to get the dentist in uh, to interview uh, the patient over the phone. It was really foreign to them. Um, I know with being in private practice for many years, a lot of my staff, I you know, multitask and a lot of my staff would got really well versed and trained on how to communicate my message to my patients, you know, to, to an extent. And uh, the patients felt comfortable because they knew them. But a lot of times if you haven't done that for a while, then all of a sudden you're having to be face to face with a a video or a computer, you know, and um, try to walk through that when you're used to somebody being in your chair, same as what we're doing right now, um, it makes it difficult. Uh, next slide, uh, slide first, uh, thank you. Um, so as the first two weeks went on, the organization made this, uh, they had made the decision that we were going to, uh, sorry, uh, should have muted my phone. Uh, the organization had made a decision to actually have us divide in half, and half of us stay at home on call, uh, in half one week, and, and half would come in and do screening and do some limited emergencies, and then we would switch that the next week. And at that time, it seemed like a perfect time to really start really getting serious about it, uh, the teledentistry. And some of the obstacles we had, of course, which we talked about, was um, the dentists were really concerned about diagnosing over the phone, maybe making the wrong call, not being able to see everything, um, concerned about na navigating um, the phone call. Not necessarily they can't do it, it's just the, um, not being in their comfort zone. Um, another obstacle was the cost of the audio visual, visual platform, you know, but with VA, they have several platforms out there, but with the ADA, they had came out that it was approved that we could use other methods. And um, so such as Zoom or FaceTime, uh, Skype, and they gave really good guidelines for that. So we decided, uh, we talked with our uh, HIM and our HIPAA officer and discussed it, and we decided we would start off with Zoom. So the next thing was the equipment, because now we were going to have our dentist be at home doing virtuals, and then our other dentists, when they would come on rotation for a week, they would actually see the emergencies that need to be seen in the clinic. And um, so we had a, the IT, getting that remote desktop, computers, cell phones. Um, the dentist did not want to really use their own personal cell phone, even though we, at the end, we ended up having to occasionally, you, you know, have their cell phone be attached to the Zoom, but um, we got through that. Um, registration in our organization, and I know it's similar in some and not in others, but our registration as far as when the patient checks in or we do pre-reg, it's a completely different department. And we don't normally gather that information. They usually take care of that. And then when they come in, we check them in and we see the patient. We don't have to deal with the billing or you know, as far as if they're qualified to be seen. So that was a big obstacle to work with a different department in that area. And um, that was probably the biggest obstacle. And still today is sometimes can be a little bit of a hiccup. So we went through different scenarios trying to get that to work a little smoother for the patient so it wouldn't take so long. And then at the beginning, not having a true set uh, setup uh, for it, you know, just starting off by creating a plan, then changing it daily. Sometimes, you know, two to three times a day we would. So um, that was difficult. And then uh, our dentists, um, uh, we didn't have a standardized note. And we, 
and some dentists were using the SOP, others were just putting a note, and that was kind of frustrating, making sure that we're getting everything that we need to to make it, you know, um, being able to bill it out as a procedure. So next slide, please. So the way um, we had created it, because we didn't want the medical actually, uh, and I refer to our medical because they've been doing it for a while. They don't have a call center, our dental department does. Uh, but they would actually, the patient would call and they would actually get a hold of um, a MST. And that is an, I imagine you guys already know, that's a medical support technician. Um, but, and then they would take the information and then they would actually tell them that a nurse would call, they'd get the telephone number, and then the nurse would actually call and interview and triage the patient. And then they would set up, um, send out an email, and then they would set up through MEND, is what they use here at this facility for the medical. And um, from there, they would, um, the patient would set that up and they would have an appointment time that they would need to do it. And then the, the, at that point, the physician would just go automatically by their self and do that whole appointment. And then after they get off, then they'd put in their orders and they would let everybody know what the support staff needed to do. Well, I knew as far as myself, I wasn't gonna feel comfortable with that because we really depend on you know, our assistants quite a bit. And our assistants really didn't have anything else to you know, do. Some were in the labor pool, but there were some that we had some projects for them to do, but they were still there. So we actually implemented a triage agent. And that triage agent, and we'll discuss it, uh, what it does, and from there, that triage agent from the call center would determine, at that point, they would determine, do we think we really need to see this patient in the clinic? Or do we actually need to, act, could we go with a virtual first? And so they were the ones that interviewed the patient, and then from there, they decided which direction we were going. So that worked out pretty well. And ready for a slide change, please. So the triage agent um, would uh, update the health history. So if we had not seen them within a year, they would, um, through Gentrex, we created the health questionnaire. Um, and they would go through our health uh, to replicate our actual health history, and they would go through that and ask all those questions. So, and then they would explain the whole process, which of course those guidelines that the ADA gave us does that very well. They would do the COVID-19 screening, and then they would disclose um, the media platform and billing insurance. Um, Again, the ADA did a really good job on um, a couple paragraphs discussing that we would be using Zoom or FaceTime and that we do know it's not as secure as some of the other platforms, but it was approved during this time and that we did inform them that they would be, we would be billing their insurance and that's what they had recommended. So we did that, put that disclosure in there. The ADA had it where you would send it through them to email and then they would sign it and then you'd send it back. But we actually decided just to do a verbal disclosure so that it worked really well for us. They would collect the pertinent patient demographics, such as, of course, we didn't have access to RPMS. We had Dentrex EHR, so we weren't for sure if we could tell if they were a patient, but we didn't know if they had their CDIB card. We didn't know if they had insurance. We didn't know, um, we'd already, of course, updated like their telephone and their address. So we started collecting that information at that point. And um, she, then she would go on to triage the patient concern on their dental concerns and determine if it needed to be a virtual or clinic visit. Next slide. I'm sorry, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go back, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so then what, from there, what would happen is, is she would set up an appointment for the patient, and then for, we would take another dental assistant, seasoned dental assistant, and she would be the virtual visit coordinator. 
And this was helping, uh, we put this process in place at the beginning because we wanted to help with that gap of just kind of putting the dentist out there on their own to actually take care of it. So she would um, actually review it, the dentist would review it, and then she would, act, um, she would call the dentist, talk with them, discuss everything, and then they would view the, char the x-rays, the previous x-rays, all the information that we'd had on that patient if it's a new patient. We had asked for a photo from the triage agent. They'd make sure that photo had been sent in um, via email or uh, text from the patient to a work phone. And from there, they uploaded it into the computer so the dentist could see it because they were not all in the same site now. And um, from there, they would get everything ready. And then she would actually send out the invitation for the virtual visit coordinator, I mean, for the virtual visit. And um, the process would start is that the, the coordinator actually introduces the dentist and she completes the initial, uh, initial beginning of the, um, the interview with the patient asking the questions so the dentist can sit back, listen, make their notes. And then um, from there, then the dentist would come on and ask some specific questions. So the generalized questions that we would ask for a limited, they would take care of. And then um, the virtual visit would actually record the time of the visit because it is very important that you'd have like the, the amount, the time that the visit was. And that's, that is from what we'd heard from um, the medical side is that you had to have the exact time of the visit. And then she would scribe parts of the notes and she would then of course take care of the patient at the end by coordinating any referrals or if, they, if the dentist felt like they needed to come in to the um, clinic, then she would actually go ahead and schedule them there. Uh, next visit. So from there, um, we knew that um, we started with the coding. And of course, I'll re reference back to the ADA. You know, they had the codes, the D995 and the D996, which we, don't, we didn't use any. Um, you could use it for sure, um, especially if you had a specialist where we have our specialists in ADA, if a general dentist was getting, gathering the information, let's say in a satellite, then they could use this code. Um, if they took the information, recorded it, or took the photos, and then went that direction. And then the 0140, uh, the limited evaluation, I think you guys are all very familiar with these. Um, the D... 190 is what we use for screening and um, then um, occasionally we've had to use with the specialist the 9992 and of course the 9310. So what would happen is, is with the coding as soon as it went to the virtual, as uh, soon as it went to the triage agent then the screen that screening code would be used so that we was considering that the screening and then when it actually went to the virtual visit, then that's when we actually added the D9995 and the D0140 or the 0170, whichever one we need was appropriate for that. If the patient came in and the, they actually did the teledentistry, but then the patient came in the same day, then that would actually revert back. The dentist would get the screening that was on the virtual and the actual visit in-house would get the D0140, okay? Um, and then if the specialist came in, if we had called a specialist in, then of course the general dentist that actually started the process would get the screening and then it would revert. Then we would let the specialist have the 0140 or the 070. Um, next slide. And this is just discussing the disclosure, um, and it just briefly talks about how the federal government will not enforce HIPAA regulations uh, concerning medical or dental offices providing non-public audio or video platforms to complete limited evaluation. Next slide. This is a template that we started. I just put them in here for you guys to see for an example. So the the virtual, I mean, the triage visit 
would start out where you would ask, you know, letting them know that a lot of these questions are going to be asked multiple times when they talk with the dentist. I thought that was very appropriate. That was actually something that came from the ADA. And, and at finding, you know, our normal triage process is what we put in here. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And I thought it was very important for the this to happen before the dentist actually saw so he could review, he or she could review the information before they even got on the phone. Uh, one thing I do know myself, I like to be prepared before I even go into the room. So I knew with them going into this and being a little uneasy about the face-to-face -face over uh, video, I knew that I needed to make sure that they had as much information as they could before they even, you know, got on that Zoom call. And this is where they're just going through um, medical conditions. And then, of course, the questionnaire would have been asked here, too. Unless, if it was over a year, they would have had the health questionnaire. If it was under, then they would just pretty much ask if there's any changes, as it states here. Go Next slide, please. And here, we were trying to determine if the dentist should ask this or the assistant. And I started thinking back as far as being a pediatric dentist, and I'm used to my assistants doing a lot of my scribing for me. So I, I opted to go ahead and train the assistant um, to ask these questions. So they asked these questions. Next slide. And then um, we just had, um, at the end, we did for the screening process, the virtual visit, we did have in start time and end time so we could record how long the triage agent was staying with the patient and everything. And then of course, we had their options for them. So it went pretty through pretty quick, had a little check off that they actually asked when they were on there. They just popped through it as they were going and then just jotted down notes and wrote those. And that was a separate note. Go ahead, next slide. And then came the virtual visit. And she, of course, I just had it auto play, you know, auto um, put in that um, th uh, the first statement that they'd already had the COVID screening because we knew where they were going to. We knew we were going to review their chart and any dental records that they have existing and that they'd been triaged before that because that's the process we'd put in place. And then, so the virtual coordinator starts these same processes over because this is a separate note at this point. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And at this, this is where the dentist still doesn't come in. And um, the, the coordinator is asking these questions. And th the main reason is to make sure we got these questions asked and that they were recorded in the chart. And um, so we went ahead and had her do this. Go ahead, next slide. And then um, she would ask the same similar questions that was asked in the screening process to determine which path to take, but also to put in this record also. So it was a duplicate, but I just felt like they needed that process to go th as they're going through this virtual. So it could definitely be changed some now, but um, and then, so she's almost done. So she's finishing up. She's asking, is the tooth, you know, is uh, the tooth loose? Yes or, you know, yes or not. Uh, any symptoms, bleeding, drainage. These are what the patients are reporting. Next slide. So this is what the dentist fills out. So he was responsible for this. And really what it is, is from the video, from the video, uh, from the photo, I'm sorry, from the photo and the video, he had to determine, did he see any bleeding? Was there any inflammation noted? Was there any swelling noted? Um, was there any purulence or drainage noted? He could describe, you know, describe what he saw. He'd also go over his home care if he was wanting to, you know, that, and he would just check that off in any type of follow-up. And then, as you can see, it's kind of small, but I definitely can send these out if anybody wants these copy of these templates. Um, and then of course, any kind of, usually we have to go to different templates since we do different things. And so I made sure that we put everything in there that we possibly could need. 
except for now we're doing COVID, we're doing rapid testing, so there is a separate note in the clinic for that. But um, they documented, um, and then of course, before the visit was over, we made sure that the, the coordinator relayed the information to the dentist so they could go in and plug it in. So next slide. So trying to make it as simple as possible for the dentist and um, make sure we have a thorough note. Um, and this is just kind of, this is where we started when we really started doing, we've been doing uh, teledentistry for eight weeks officially where we've been charging out. And these are the, uh, of course, the incoming calls that come in to our clinic that can be uh, to the dental services. Um, we usually run about 1,200 when it's non-COVID time a uh, week. So um, as you can see, we really started in very slow at the beginning and we've had some ups and downs between four and six on the triaging. But um, even from triaging to where they needed a virtual, there's a pretty, um, such as week four, there was a big difference on what we actually felt like needed to be a virtual visit. So we were definitely, and it could be at the diff, the time, because we were probably a little bit more strict at that time, at that week four, which would have been the, let's see, that would have been um, probably the third week in April. And then as you can see, uh, when things started relaxing as far as with the nation, we actually, our calls went up. And then we actually were, um, they were a little bit closer as far as what our triage and what we did with the virtual. And then we still didn't really increase our treatment as much until this week. And uh, this week's been pretty crazy for us for emergencies. Next slide. Insurance companies and reimbursement. So there are several insurance companies that we've had reimbursement from. Um, most of the time, I've got them listed here, but most of the time they are not paying on the D9995 or the D9996 because they don't consider it a separate benefit. But uh, we have gotten payment from uh, UMR, which um, is a, when I Googled it, it says something about United Healthcare. I'm not really for sure about it, but and it says that it's actually universal medical records. But um, when I do Google it, United Healthcare comes up. But I don't. I, I just know they did send me a claim that they actually paid for the uh, limited and they paid for the teledentistry. Um, but that's the only one that we've actually been paid on the code. Um, but we have been getting reimbursement from 90, 5% of the insurances that we build with on the, the actual 0140 or 0170. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when we looked at this and we looked at reading what the insurances, sorry. <coughs> looking at what the insurances would consider if we tr we tried to do a video always, but sometimes our elderly people could not <coughs> could not actually do the Zoom, and they didn't have someone to help them. We tried that, so um, we actually sometimes they were able to do a photo and an audio, and we were able we still actually uh, did that as a teledentistry. If we were only able to do audio, we just did it as a screening. Um, we have been getting reimbursed. Um, the numbers are not in because our billing is on that same rotation. Not all the numbers are in as far as one week at home and one week here. So um, that's not been really available to us right now. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, next slide. <laughs> our recent obstacles. You know, we had the first ones that we would have to, we got past those, but these are our recent ob obstacles. Still trying to create the process, and then the uh, biggest thing is communication, communication, because we ended up having sometimes three to four dentists on doing triage from home, depending on how busy they were, how long the, it was taking, because it usually takes 
when you're on with the patient, it usually, for the actual virtual, it was averaging probably about 10 to 15 minutes. But the whole process to get it done is a good 35 to 40 minutes. So we knew that we had, we brought on, uh, we didn't have all the dentists at home. We just kind of did a rotation where they had two doing it. And now this week, I didn't put the numbers in for this week, but we actually have four um, dentists in four teams actually doing it from home. And um, they're staying pretty busy. They, they're, seeing, they're doing probably about 10 to 12 virtuals per day. Uh, Pre-registration still is uh, uh, difficult. It was very difficult because we were trying to gather the information for them and um, that was causing a big roadblock and then we were trying to transfer the patient over and it was too too much for the patient to be talking to multiple people. So we stopped that and then uh, we quickly trained somebody in dental how to look in RPMS, which is very difficult to do. You wouldn't think it would, but um, it's sometimes difficult for departments wanting to share certain things on that, but we did actually get her where she, we have one person that is, as soon as they call in from the call center, they get put on the phone board, and before they even get called for triage, she's going in and checking really quick to make sure they have all the information, and that seems to work really well. The other thing that we ended up doing is, as we had, we started in creating a true team. A dentist, a specific dentist with a triage agent and a virtual coordinator for that day. They are a team. We're not calling, you know, two coordinators calling, working with one dentist or two, one coordinator, you know, or vice versa. We were literally creating those teams and that has worked out really, really well. It's made it a lot smoother. And then we are in search of a, um, more permanent platform. I think we'll go with men because that's what our organization is using in medical. And I know there's a lot out there right now for dental and I'll, we'll just kind of sit back and wait and see what actually develops in that area. Next slide, please. The results that we see is that I see an increased confidence on communicating via, uh, via teledentistry. It's probably a 60-40, 40 percent of the general dentists love uh, the teledentistry. They like that communication with the dentist, I mean with the patient, but the 60 percent, they're still, they still rather see them in the chair. Um, and then we did realize that we can cert, uh, treat certain emergencies via virtual visits. Um, not completely, but we can definitely start that process. We definitely decreased the amount of PPE utilized, and we streamlined the process for our specialists. Um, normally, um, we were having to have the patient come in and see the, uh, the general dentist and then be referred to specialists. Now we're actually able to act, do um, the virtual, then the dentist determines, the general dentist determines they need to see the specialist and then we'll go ahead and get them set up with one of the specialists. Uh, improved customer service. Everybody's been very positive about it. All the patients, very positive. Uh, the biggest thing is they want us to get back to routine care, which we've not been approved to do that yet. And then it helped us uh, streamline for a COVID-19 schedule where um, it worked out really well. We started off with FaceTime and then quickly we ended up going to Zoom. It just seemed to work better than the FaceTime. And of course, FaceTime is limited, I mean, has its limitations because you have to have an iPhone. And then we did create a potential revenue source. For this, like I said, the numbers are still out on that, um, but we do know we weren't bringing in much anyway with the COVID situation. So anything, you know, is a positive. Next slide. You know, where we go from here, I've, we've really decided and we've gotten approval to continue past, you know, post COVID with teledentistry. And um, we plan on using it. Right now we actually still have to have the patient come in, be triaged, determine if they can be seen today, if it's the same day, or do they need to just be scheduled in the next, you know, 48 hours next week? You know, we're going to actually use this to triage our emergency. So we won't have a walk-in basis. They'll still get seen that day, but we'll have um, a triage process to determine that. Um, consults with our specialist, especially if we have a um, general, a general dentist in one of our satellite clinics. And um, 
they need to talk to a specialist and the patient's right there, then we want to be able to create an appointment, you know, if there's a specialist available at that time, if they have a broken appointment, then they can actually, we can create a process so they can get on there with the patient. And we can go ahead and let that dentist have that security of being able to know what the next process should happen. Should they be referred? Do they need a root canal or do they need that extracted? Um, things that they sometimes want to call that, dent, uh, that specialist and find out that we're going to utilize that long distance patients for initial consults, knowing that we'll have to be doing a detailed consult. And we're talking about specialists here right before they have treatment, but we can start that process and make those in-house appointments a lot and not as long. So that way we may be able to be more efficient and being able to see more of those uh, patients because our specialty lists are quite long, which I imagine everybody's are. Multidisciplinary consultations, uh, PD the pediatrics is already reaching out to us. They've already been using them. If they've got one in the satellite and they want to see uh, the pediatric dentist to see, take a look at something, then if they're available, we have case managers in every department so they can actually synchronize those so that we might be able to go ahead and talk with that patient right then with the pediatrician there or for primary care also post-operative appointments. If they're pretty straightforward, we've started doing post-operative appointments when we've needed to. Um, we plan on creating a, a schedule. When we do have broken appointments, I don't, for us, we're about 25% on our broken appointment rate. So at this point, we're going to train um, our hygienist when they have broken appointments to do the triage. And then from there, and our assistants, if they're available, that they can triage and they can determine if they need to see a dentist and then we'll actually put them in a slot where there's a broken appointment that we don't think we can actually get an active, you know, a, I don't want to say live patient, but get a patient in the chair for that day. Try to actually capture that opportunity. And then um, who's on virtuals? Um, the specialist, the general dentist, the assistants, um, and the dental hygienist now. Um, uh, so we still plan on going back with our concept of uh, the dentist introducing themselves to the new, their new assigned patients because we've created panels for the patient, the, the dentist. So um, those will be create a connection for that patient. You know, next slide. And I'll leave it here. There are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. So today is the right day to love, believe, and do, and mostly live, Dalai Lama. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Bus. Mm -hmm. That's great information, and um, I love that quote. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to move right into uh, Dr. Latanya Shelton Miller and her presentation. She's going to be talking about protocols and best practices to safely reopen dental clinics. Uh, she's from the Little Axe Health Center uh, with the Absentee Shawnee Tribe. And Dr. Miller will get, okay, there's your slides. Good afternoon, everyone. As um, Julie mentioned and Brett mentioned earlier, I am LaTanya Shelton Miller, the dental director for the Absentee Shawnee Tribal Health System. And I am located at the Little X Health Center. I'd like to thank all of you for allowing me to speak today. Um, so this afternoon, I do have a lot of information to share and hopefully it will be beneficial to you. But this afternoon, I would like to share with you some of the protocols and best practice options that hopefully will be helpful to you as you look at reopening your dental clinics beyond emergency care. Some things I'm sure you're already doing, but my hope is that you will leave this presentation with um, a few dental pearls that might take your clinic um, less time to look at reopening and hopefully something you can implement immediately. Next slide, please. So some of the questions to ask yourself and consider as you look at reopening is where to start. Are you ready to reopen? 
Do you have what you need? And how do you manage your patients? How should you screen your patients? And how should they be scheduled? Also, what infection control and workflow protocols do you already have in place? Dentistry's done a really good job with infection control. So we have a lot of things in place and probably are ahead of the game compared to some other areas and industries. So you may not have to develop as many as you think you do, but there's still some to develop from um, actually, you know, the COVID crisis. Do you have the appropriate PPE uh, to safely treat your patients in this post-COVID time? If so, do you have an adequate supply? I know for us, um, the supply of PPE is, is something that's kind of um, an issue and probably ongoing, and I'm sure it is for you as well. Um, but if you do have the appropriate PPE, do you have enough available? Uh, since we know COVID-19 is thought to be spread through respiratory droplets, and many of the instruments that we use in dentistry sprays aerosols that can mix with those droplets and become airborne, increases our risk of spreading the virus and bacteria. So how do we control this aerosol? So this is some of the questions and some of the things I wanna share with you. You also have to look at what type of services you would like to provide when you reopen. Do you open business as usual? or do you slowly add things uh, and as things improve with the pandemic? For many of us, our equipment hasn't been in use for quite some time, and we wanna make sure that it's properly working when we reopen. And lastly, every day there's some new information coming out on how to manage and navigate through the COVID-19 crisis. So um, what, guidelines are you using? What recommendations uh, are you using and what should you be looking for? So as I go through this presentation, I'll examine some of the things that we're doing at our clinic that I think are best practices and protocols and hopefully to help address some of these questions. Next slide. So for us at our dental clinic, um, to answer the questions, where do we start? Are we ready? we assembled a COVID-19 dental reopening team, which I would suggest to all of you to also um, develop a team if you haven't already. Our team consisted of uh, our dental staff, three to four people, and included our dental hygienist, uh, our lead dental hygienist, our lead dental assistant, our office manager, um, myself, as well as the deputy dental director. Um, I would also encourage you to include your health center's infection control manager, uh, the, your facilities manager, and of course your administration to help you guide, uh, help guide you and provide you input as you go along. So what is the goal of this team? Well, the goal of our team, and it should be of yours as well, is to review the ever-changing um, guidelines and recommendations from various sources like the ADA, the CDC, and from there you can start determining what infection control and workflow protocols you're needing along with what PPE needs and safety measures for patients and staff you need to put in place. The team will also be charged to develop a patient triaging and scheduling workflow. Another important task of this team is to complete a risk assessment for your dental clinic. This is really important. Completing a risk assessment is a great best practice to determine your PPE and equipment needs, your risk of transmission, and how well COVID-19 uh, has impacted or will impact your patient services, staff, or your community. Before, because for each of us, it'll be a little bit different and we'll all be impacted in different ways. So it's good to know what that is. For example, um, the number of patients that we can treat post-COVID is extremely reduced um, due to a multitude of things in our uh, facility, like we're having to social distance our patients in the clinical area. We're having to wait 30 minutes to an hour or more to use our operatories again after disinfecting. 
and of course putting on layers of PPE um, that we in, in the past really have only reserved for surgical procedures. So this is where you would start your reopening journey. Next slide. So some general patient management and pretreatment protocols to consider when reopening is taking all patient temperatures and asking COVID-19 screening questions prior to entering the facility for treatment. I know many uh, clinics are already doing this if they're seeing emergency uh, patients. Um, so I would continue to do that. And at our clinic, um, we have a tent set up in front of the facility, which is great. So all of our patients are being screened right up front and then allowed into the facility if they pass all the questions and they don't have a temperature. You should uh, have all your patients wear a mask uh, when they enter the facility and while, the health and while in the health center. Um, this is basically to reduce the, just the potential spread of um, respiratory droplets. In our health center, we have decided uh, this can be a cloth mask, it can be a surgical mask, or a bandana type covering um, because, you know, everyone won't have a surgical mask, but at least they will have something. <clears throat> Excuse me. You should only allow the patient and one guardian if the patient is a minor or elderly or physically or mentally um, disabled in the clinic for treatment. Um, four other, you know, really great practice, uh, patient practice management and best practices I feel that is worth mentioning here is having your patient stay in their car until you're ready to treat them. Utilize a runner to escort patients in the to the dental clinic. We're doing this as a way to keep patients from randomly walking throughout the health center, increasing the potential spread uh, of COVID-19. As some patients may um, have COVID-19, but may be asymptomatic. And lastly, um, have patients practice hand hygiene after treatment and before treatment. Uh, this is the no germ in, no germ out philosophy. And we're also recommending patients brush their, their teeth prior to their appointment. Um, this is just to help cut down on a little bit of the bacteria load and, and, and hopefully just cut down on, on the spread of any type of virus or bacteria within the clinic. All of these patient management and pretreatment protocols um, provide barriers for COVID-19 and has really helped us hopefully reduce the amount of time the patient is in the health center and therefore reducing their exposure and ours. Next slide. So some of the um, patient screening and scheduling considerations, uh, as you've previously heard um, from our first speaker, that screening is going to be very, very important and scheduling is definitely going to be different. So we have decided to do a phone screening of all of our patients prior to their appointment, either when the appointment is being scheduled or confirmed. The screening will include the COVID-19 questions, review of the patient's health history, and the review of their medical um, medications, along with informing them what to expect uh, at their appointment due to COVID-19 changes. Things will be definitely different. I feel like now we, we kind of look like we're ready to walk on the moon when we enter um, the treatment room. So uh, patients need to be aware of that so that when they come in there, they know that that's gonna be something different. So for the month of June and July, this will be completed by our dental assistants and our dental hygienists in our clinic. Uh, we just feel like they are really comfortable with using our uh, EHR system, uh, and so this will help us with triaging our patients. We will also use teledentistry. We have used some since um, the COVID-19 crisis has happened, uh, but we're going to mainly use it uh, as an alternative to, to in-office care and as a triaging to, to assess our patients' dental conditions and determine whether 
um, the patient really needs to be seen in the dental clinic. As far as scheduling your patients, I would highly suggest a soft opening to limit the number of scheduled patients that you allow into the clinic. Uh, this will hopefully allow you to work through any uh, workflow issues that will surely happen because there's a lot of changes that we're making to our regular dental care routine. I'd also suggest the staggering appointment times. I know a lot of times we do this already, um, but this is just a good best practice for um, dentistry to just limit the number of patients in the clinic. Uh, so it reduces their time and their interaction with each other if you kind of stagger them coming in and out. You should also consider uh, two columns of scheduling one for aerosol generating procedure and one for non aerosol generating procedures and scheduling at least this is what we're looking at doing this isn't something to think about scheduling the aerosol generating procedures uh, right before lunch or closer to lunch uh, to allow additional disinfection time and to allow the air uh, particles and aerosol to dissipate during lunch uh, early morning priority appointments for patients with compromised health is a good press, best practice. And we think this is really good because less people will have entered the facility, therefore hopefully reducing their exposure to others. We're also looking at assigning one provider to do hygiene um, patient checks, uh, especially since, you know, certain PPE like um, gowns and masks, and especially the N95 masks, are being in limited supply. So we're suggesting that um, if you just have one provider that is uh, dedicated to doing those hygiene checks, it keeps um, the providers from having to don and doff their PPE to check hygiene patients. So um, we're also suggesting that you use, well, we're not really suggesting it, but some have suggested using the teledentistry and an enter or a camera to check um, hygiene. But if you're like me, I really want to see my patient, I want to talk with them, and I want to use an explorer to physically check their teeth. It's not necessarily uh, not an option, but for me, I would prefer to physically be able to check their teeth. Next slide. So, with all of that, you really have to look at what preventative measures and infection control measures are you wanting to implement in your um, dental clinic. So here's a few um, suggestions and best practice measures to follow when reopening. Of course, um, hopefully we're all following OSHA universal precautions and hand washing protocols. And for us at the start of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, and at the start of the day and after lunch, we're flushing our dental unit lines for at least 15 minutes, part, pardon me, 15 seconds. We're using surgical bays for extractions and aerosol generating procedures. Uh, if, you, if you have them, I would highly suggest using any type of closed off surgical rooms or bays that you have. We are fortunate to have four surgical rooms and with doors, for isolation in our dental clinic. Uh, some places may not be uh, as fortunate, but if you do, that would be the best place to really utilize um, for any aerosol generating procedures. We are also social distancing our patients uh, in the clinic by using every other operatory. And I would suggest doing this if you, if you have the capability to do this. We're utilizing a runner or rover dental assistant when available to keep general, dental assistants and the dentists that are treating the patients in the dental operatory so that if they need additional instruments or they need uh, additional things, um, it keeps them from having to exit the operatory to don and dock PPE. We're also, um, within our clinic looking at controlling the way our patients are entering and exiting the dental clinic. And I would suggest that if you have multiple entrances, 
for us, um, we have at least three main ways to enter our dental facility. So we've decided that the main hallway will be our main entrance for all of our patients and that we will allow, depending on where your operatory is located, to allow them to go down the side halls. Uh, and this just kind of keeps people um, flowing a little better and keeping things a little smoother as we um, have patients come in and, and have patients dismissed. We are also establishing no PPE um, zones to reduce the potential uh, to viruses spread to non-clinical areas. I would suggest uh, you use only EPA approved disinfectants for COVID-19 and you can find a list of those um, disinfectants on the CDC or the EPA website. Um, I listed here that a wait of 15 minutes after treatment is completed to clean the room because as, as of May 19, 2020, the CDC has recommended this. Um, and this is just to allow air particles to settle. So you should allow at least 30 minutes to an hour to pass after disinfecting an operatory before reusing. Uh, you may consider um, waiting even longer. Uh, this will depend on each clinic's individual uh, circumstances. Um, as we're still really unsure of how long the virus can stay suspended in air and really remain actively contagious on surfaces. So each clinic will have to kind of make a, a decision there and it really depends on your patient flow as well uh, and, and your, your clinic setup. Next slide, please. Okay, on to the elusive PPE. For us, we have decided that our PPE requirement would be the same for both aerosol producing procedures and non-aerosol producing procedures. We are using the preferred PPE image you see on your left with the N95 mask, gloves, face shields, and surgical gowns. Um, we are recommending head covers and shoe covers. However, in our clinic, we're not making this mandatory at this time. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, just having the mandatory PPE on um, can get quite warm. Um, I, I know I felt it <laughs> just seeing emergency patients. And so we're not necessarily making extra things mandatory, but as this goes on, as the pandemic kind of, it, it could surge up again. This may be a good practice to have shoe covers and hair covers as well. So two major PPE concerns that we've had in our clinic um, and probably you also have it in your clinic, is the limited supply of N95 masks and gowns. Um, since this is the case for us, we are using um, N95 masks, um, well, I guess you could call it limited use. Um, and we're using the, the limited extended use according to the CDC recommendations. So we're doing this by covering um, our N95 mask with uh, a surgical mask and a face shield to help reduce aerosol and droplet contact with the N95 mask. We're also um, replacing them after five high aerosol procedures. And if they're damaged, uh, we're also replacing them. Um, this was also something that was kind of suggested by the CDC. Uh, you all may decide to do less aerosol, you know, maybe three instead of five. It'll be on an individual basis there. We're also storing our mask in restaurant uh, container, to-go containers. And it's almost like the perfect size to put your N95 mask in. Um, we're also using paper bags when we don't have the uh, restaurant to go containers to help preserve our mask as well. So as far as the gowns, although we're wearing uh, fluid resistant uh, surgical gowns, we've made the decision at our health center uh, to only use our gowns once. Uh, we feel this is a great safety practice, so this is something you may want to look at. However, our burn rate for surgical gowns is quite high. But, you know, again, we think it's a good safety practice and hopefully as 
everything goes by and FEMA allows a few more supplies to come through, we'll definitely have the supplies we need. We also uh, review the donning and doffing sequences with our staff. And as I stated earlier, um, we have designated some donning and doffing areas in the clinic. And I would highly suggest you look at doing that, uh, depending on how your clinic is set up. As a side note, when it comes to PPE, uh, if you haven't calculated your daily and monthly PPE burn rate, I highly encourage you to do so. The number of gowns and masks uh, that our clinic needs right now, just seeing emergency patients, is very eye-opening. And I'm sure some of you who are um, currently seeing emergency patients uh, have noticed this as well. And we're seeing a reduced number of patients. So imagine when we try to get at least to some kind of uh, resemblance of before COVID-19, how much PPE we will go through. So the CDC has a great burn rate calculator uh, on their website uh, for you to utilize, or you can determine your PPE needs by looking at um, the number of providers you have uh, and the number of patients you plan on uh, scheduling each day and calculate from there. Next slide. So we know that COVID-19 is, is, is spread through um, respiratory droplets and um, through and it, that it's airborne. So for dentistry, this is something we definitely need to look at and focus on. So some of the ways to look at aerosol mitigation and control when you're reopening is some of the things we're trying here. Uh, you know, there's lots of, there's a lots of things out there, but I'm just listing a few that we are looking at using or are currently using. So we're looking at using a pre-procedural rinse like Peroxyl or Oxyl Opti White. Uh, mouthwash or mixing your own 1% hydrogen peroxide mixture by diluting one part 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide to two parts sterile water. Um, we have chosen to mix our own uh, mixture. It just seems to be easier for us and a little bit more um, cost effective. Uh, I know that there has been talk that this may not be advantageous, but um, I believe at this point it can't hurt. And I have listed a journal article uh, here for you to reference that um, you might find useful if you decide to use a pre-rinse. We have also uh, chosen to use uh, high vac uh, isolation systems uh, like uh, dry shield, iso dry, you know, relief. Uh, there's several different ones. I've just kind of listed them there to try. Um, we have chosen to use dry shields. I'm, I'm not advocating for one versus the other. That just happened to be what we already had in our clinic. And we're utilizing this for each aerosol producing procedure that we have. We're also utilizing rubber dams when possible. And we are uh, in the process of purchasing extra oral uh, suction units for all of our operatories, uh, along with about four portable germicidal um, UVC air purifiers. Um, we just really want to do the best we can to help mitigate any kind of aerosol um, uh, that we're producing. We um, also have ordered a UV light cabinet um, that we're going to hopefully be able to use to disinfect our face shield. So that's another option to look at. We a micro cab to reduce and contain solid airborne particles um, when we're adjusting dentures and partials and crowns. So if you don't have a micro cab, that may be something you want to look at purchasing for your clinic. Uh, we are currently not using ultrasonic uh, planers or scalers, um, or air polishers, until further notice by the CDC to help also mitigate aerosol production. Next slide, please. So we're all wondering, um, you know, what dental services to provide as we reopen. Um, I would say 
as we return to safe practices of dental uh, services, we should all consider um, going in phases. Um, looks like my slide has a little, my phases are kind of running into it there, but um, hopefully you can still see the information. Um, I really think we should consider working in phases uh, while keeping in mind um, mindful watch on the pandemic and, and its effects in your particular area or your particular clinic and throughout the country. So we have chosen to is, is do that. It's actually, um, I have some feedback there. Some, um, we are looking at doing phases. Um, right now, we are currently in phase one, which is basically seeing emergency only, um, emergencies only, simple extractions, and avoiding hygiene appointments. And in phase two, uh, we plan on continuing to see the emergency patients. Um, we want to actually incorporate, uh, along with the simple extractions, some surgical extractions. We're also looking at um, introducing just routine dentistry. Some of it we've already been doing just like exams, x-rays, and small, and we're going to also incorporate small, you know, one surface fillings along with delivering our lab cases. We also want to start seeing child and teen profies and scheduling same household family appointments so that we can minimize um, how often we need to clean our operatory between each family member. And of course, we're going to limit the number of high risk patients we're seeing. You know, we want to probably wait another month. Um, before we really start allowing some of uh, those high risk patients to come in for treatment. But if they do need to be treated or they do need to come in, we're looking at uh, having them come in uh, in the early morning appointments to kind of reduce their exposure. Next slide, please. So for phase three, um, we are going to adhere to all the procedures. Um, that we were currently doing in phase two. And we're looking at adding some simple restorative, you know, that's increasing up to, you know, your two surface fillings, um, things like that. And of course, we're looking at trying to incorporate some hygiene and hand scaling uh, only. We have quite a few uh, hygiene patients that were um, having to be rescheduled since we closed down for just emergency only. So um, the sooner we can see our hygiene patients and get that preventative measures going again, the better. But of course, it really will just depend on how this pandemic goes. So then in phase four, we're going to adhere to all the previous phases and we're going to include the more complex restorative procedures like the root canals, uh, crown and bridge, and of course, uh, hopefully include full hygiene with the use of uh, ultrasonic scalers. Um, and of course, as again, it, our phased services really is contingent on any new CDC or ADA or state regulations or recommendations that come out or any surges in the virus. So um, as you look at doing your phases, you really just would need to be vigilant of what recommendations are changing because it seems to be dynamic and happening every day. So um, next slide. So some additional best practice suggestions, um, and there are tons out there, but I just wanted to list a few. Um, some additional best practice uh, suggestions are surgical masks worn at all time in the clinic for all employees. We're currently doing that at our uh, health center um, as we walk in for the day to um, get started to treat patients we're all wearing a mask when we leave out for the day and, and during the day we're wearing a surgical mask. So that is a good best practice and suggestion if you're able to do so. Um, we suggest uh, placing your um, chairs six feet apart in your reception areas and removing all the 
magazines that we love to sit and read while we're waiting uh, to be seen. Uh, your TV remotes, toys, and any other objects that may typically be handled by patients. Well, I also suggest doing um, placing plexiglass barriers at your check-in and check-out areas uh, and provide um, keyboard covers if you're able to. Uh, we have, if you come into our clinic now, you will see that we've already placed plexiglass barriers at our check-in and check-out areas. We also suggest um, disinfecting high-touch items twice daily on a schedule, uh, like your door handles, your telephones, things like that. Um, I say on a schedule because if you do it on a schedule and you, and you write it down and you have a checkoff list and you have someone dedicated to doing it, it will, it will get done and, and done in a timely fashion. We also suggest that your front reception staff wear masks and gloves. Um, we're not totally paperless, so as patients are handing information back, uh, we're trying to limit that, of course, but uh, it would be great for your staff to have gloves on as well. Uh, with that, it is great if you have the capability to use electronic consent forms and health history forms when possible. Um, we're also looking at limiting the nitrous oxide use um, because you know, it's, it's more difficult to clean those noses and, and, and the hoses from nitrous. Uh, we also consider using uh, so sodium diamine fluoride for patients with multiple areas of decay. And additional uh, setup time and break down time between patients is a good idea. And I do suggest you do a mock um, walk through with your uh, staff so, as a good practice so that everyone is familiar with the new protocols and how long each step takes and time uh, from the time the patient receives their screening, their temperature check, and completes their treatment. This is important so that um, as you reopen, it, you will know how it will affect the number of patients that you can reasonably see on a daily basis, as well as how your clinic will flow. Um, time will tell, but uh, I don't think we will practice dentistry the same way again and um, ever again after this pandemic. Next slide. So I've included a uh, equipment reopening checklist uh, to remind everyone uh, to check your equipment to ensure that it is working properly um, when you reopen as some of your equipment uh, has been sitting idle for several weeks. So uh, this checklist is um, compliments of uh, Benco Dental. Um, not a plug for them, just it was a nice uh, check off list and I felt it would be great to present here. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a list of helpful websites uh, for you to look at as you start at uh, looking at reopening your dental clinic. So far for me, <clears throat> excuse me, the CDC and the ADA and the NOAA um, listserv has been the most helpful for me. I didn't list the uh, ODA or the Oklahoma Dental Board here, but your state and local um, dental associations and board websites are also great resources that you should check for more information as well. Next slide. So in closing, um, we're all in this together. So um, I have my contact information listed here and, and I will be happy to share any templates and uh, information that I've received. And I would ask that you do the same because uh, we're all rowing in this boat together and, and kind of going up river <laughs> here and, and so, um, I want to thank all of you all for your time and all the courageous work that you're doing uh, and that you have done in the past and currently doing in this unprecedented times. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Um, that was great, great information. I think it's going to be useful to a lot of people. Um, I, I want to uh, move quickly. I've got to keep an eye on time. Uh, I want to make sure that we get to uh, our very last speaker, Dr. Karen Luce. She is from the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. And Dr. Luce, let me get your slides ready. And here we go. Hello, 
So I'm Dr. Karen Luce from the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority, and I'll make this very brief. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to go over Sooner Care's policy regarding teledentistry. As Dr. Van Booskirk mentioned, she's doing a lot of teledentistry, as many of you are. So I'm really happy that Sooner Care is able to help out in this matter during this time of emergency. Next slide. So this is just a copy of what was on our global messaging board regarding our teledentistry policy. It is a temporary policy. It was uh, started in early April and we will extend it as necessary as long as, as long as necessary. Next slide. So just to explain the policy, um, basically what this says is providers can get reimbursed for the D0140 code if used by way of teledentistry during the state of emergency due to COVID-19 when it is coupled with a D9995 code. Uh, so again, as Dr. Van Buskirk mentioned, this is a code for synchronous real-time encounters. Um, that means that the information is real-time happening at the same time with the provider and the patient. It's not information that's being transferred at a later time. Um, this code is utilized. It's not real. There's no fee associated with it because it's to be reported in addition to other procedures, generally diagnostic, that are delivered to the patient on the date of service. Um, so it's just a code that's saying that you're doing that 0140 code, but you're doing it by the way of teledentistry. Um, and we're very glad to have this code because, again, um, this eliminates patient contact, so it can reduce exposures to patients and providers. It gives you another tool to really evaluate whether or not a patient needs to come in your office. Uh, next slide, please. So in order for a provider to be uh, reimbursed for teledentistry, they must, uh, and again, this is for Medicaid providers, they must uh, follow Oklahoma Healthcare Authority telehealth policy, which says that an encounter must be a two-way, real-time, interactive communication utilizing audio and visual technology. So there has to be the audio and visual components. There, it can't be one or the other. Um, this also says that our policy says that parents or guardian must present the minor, but they do not need to be part of the visit or attend. Um, they need to be involved, of course, with decision making. Uh, our policy also says that members have full access to all transmitted medical information, with the exception of live interactive video, as many times these are not saved. Um, and next slide. So uh, tel a televisit has many things in common with a real life in-person visit. So for one, the provider must review the dental records prior to the visit and should review the member's health, social, and dental histories. And this may require that patients submit uh, documentation by way of fax or email prior to the visit in order to get those signatures and all that paperwork done. Uh, also, just like a real in-person visit, there must be documentation uh, regarding the visit. Uh, Oklahoma Healthcare Authority requires a de detailed chart notes that include the purpose of the visit, any recommendations made, the start and stop times of the visit, as well as the service provider's credentials and the provider's signature. And next slide. So, so that's it. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, uh, we're, I think we're still going to have question and answer here, but also you're free to get in touch with the agency at any time um, by contacting us and Julie will have a, an email directly to our dental unit as well at the end of this, I believe. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Appreciate that. Um, I want to make sure that we have um, a few minutes, um, you know, a couple of minutes at least, to, to do some Q and A. But before we do that, I, I want to um, I wanted to to call on Dr. Joel Knutson. He's the Dental Informatics and Project Manager for the Indian Health Service Electronic Dental Record uh, to see if he can fill in any blanks for attendees in regards to the guidance that was released from IHS for documenting and reporting patient teledentistry visits. 
Um, Dr. Knudsen, if you are on, do you mind just taking um, a, a, a minute or two to fill in any blanks if possible? And Sarah, if he is, he might be muted. Um, if you could unmute him, possible. I He might be on the phone. So okay. I'm not sure which number it would be. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Well, if he has anything to add, then um, we can certainly send that out in an email to attendees uh, for uh, for further information on on that guidance document that was sent out. Um, okay, so let's move on to um, questions. So, if you have any questions for our speakers, if you could just put those um, in the chat box. I know we had a couple earlier in the presentation, um, so. Uh, Sarah, if you don't mind um, reading a couple of those questions, and again, I've got 228, so uh, we're going to do this just for, uh, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time, so just a couple of minutes for Q&A. So we got a couple questions about the slides, um, and we will be making those available after the presentation that will be posted as well along with the recording, and that might take a couple days. But one of the um, uh, different question besides that was from Alita. And it says, I'm a policy person. Our state, Arizona, only covers emergency dental care for adults on Medicaid. Are the services described for teledentistry during the national emergency considered emergencies? Dr. Luce, can you answer that question? Oh, I'm so sorry. So, so please repeat the question. So it says, I'm a policy person from Arizona. And in Arizona, um, the state only covers emergency dental care for adults on Medicaid. Are the services described for teledentistry during the national emergency considered emergency? So, so each state Medicaid is different, so I apologize. My slides really refer to the state of Oklahoma. Um, so, but I, in Oklahoma, so our teledentistry applies only to one code, the 0140, so that's the only procedure um, that will be covered under teledentistry, only a limited exam, no other, no other codes. And every state Medicaid is different, although I think most Medicaid, most states, uh, their Medicaid authorities or um, services are doing teledentistry. I think there's a few that are not, so you need to check with your state um, because they all are separate entities. So the state of Oklahoma is covering the limited exam with teledentistry. Okay, thank you, Dr. Luce. Okay, Sarah, we probably have time for one more question uh, before we before we wrap up. So um, there's one from Christine Shook and says, "Hi, what recommendations do you have for using nitrous in cleaning the tubing, etc." I guess I can answer this. Um, for us, we're basically trying to limit using nitrous in general, but um, what we're doing, we do have disposable noses, so we are sterilizing them like we normally would. We are also taking the tubing apart, um, and actually, in the past, that's not something we would normally do, but we're actually taking the tubing apart as well and sterilizing it. 
the corrugated hoses are a little bit different animal to tackle, but uh, as far as we know, this is the best option. So if you're going to use nitrous, either use a disposable nose, which is not necessarily most cost effective, but definitely um, sterilize those noses um, after every use and take apart your hoses and actually uh, sterilize them as well. And then just kind of lay them out open to allow uh, the flow. That's a big concern for us because the, the, long, the long hoses require you to kind of fold them together to actually be able to sterilize them. So if you have really large sterilizers, that's great because you can kind of elongate those hoses so that the air flows uh, better through them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I want to, so um, I've got about, uh, I've got 2.33 central time. Um, just a reminder, this is being recorded. So I know there are some, some questions that are still left in the chat box and we will, um, we will get back to you. So we'll, we'll reach out to you and get your, uh, we'll get those questions answered and, um, uh, and reach out to you all um, individually. So I want to make sure that, um, um, that those questions get answered. So we'll reach back out to um, those folks that, that we didn't get a chance to call on. Um, okay, um, and then also, I think like uh, Brett um, had said earlier, we will be sharing, uh, we'll have slides and um, the recording that we will send out shortly, hopefully maybe tomorrow, um, uh, later this afternoon or tomorrow morning uh, for, your, um, for your reference. So in closing, um, Sarah, next slide here. Um, I just wanna say really quick, um, the Native Oral Health Network put together a resource guide for the dental office, um, really for health providers and, and clinical staff. Uh, just because there's so much information coming through so many resources and things are changing so quickly, uh, this, this guide includes embedded links that will take you directly to websites um, as they update information. Um, it's videos on how to properly don and doff PPE, a guide to masks, a lot of the same stuff that we were talking about here today, return to work toolkits that were developed by ADA and the ADHA, um, and uh, a few other resources. So if this is something um, that you're interested in and would be helpful, please send me an email and I will, um, I will send this out to you. Also plan on getting this on um, Southern Plains Tribal Health Board's uh, website, um, probably hopefully within the next week as well. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so um, here is the information to obtain CDE credit. Uh, Again, thank you so much to Dr. Tim Ricks and um, uh, over there at the Indian Health Service Division of Oral Health for sponsoring the CDE credit um, or the CDE hours. Uh, if uh, I'll also send this information out to, um, to those of you if, if you're not able to get this information down before we close here. So if you need <coughs> out to me and we can get this information to you. Um, okay, next slide. I want to thank you all uh, so much for attending. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to um, the Indian Health Service. Thank you for everyone for attending. We appreciate you um, uh, plugging in and finding interest in this. Um, so I'm wondering, I know a lot of people, just before we close out here, I know there are a lot of people that are um, asking question, uh, the five uses of the N95 mask. Um, so is there any way, just because that's a question that's being asked quite a few times in the chat box, is there any way that we could answer that really quick before, uh, before we log off here? Yes, um, as I stated in the, um, in the presentation, that that is something that we have chosen to do, and that was something I believe we um, found from the CDC recommendations, if you're going to use extended use of your uh, N95 mask. Again, like I stated, you may decide that's three uses, you may decide it's more than that, but we're actually covering it with surgical masks, so as, as a way to help 
keep it from having splatter and as well as using our face shield. So um, if I can, and we can post it on the website, I'll try to find that uh, where we found that in the CDC recommendations. Okay, yeah, that would be great, Dr. Miller. So uh, we'll download this, the chat box and we'll, that, we'll get that information out to um, all the attendees. Um, if we're missing anything, we've got um, my emails listed on there as well as, as Brett. Um, so again, thank you everything, uh, everyone for, um, for tuning in and everyone take care. And if you need anything, just let us know. Bye everyone.